If you're trying to become more powerful in a video game, the best way to do it is through hard work, perseverance, and dedication to your goals. Wait, that can't be right. Because in our experience, oftentimes the best way to get more powerful in a video game is to be a total and utter bastard, stabbing people in the back, sometimes literally, to get ahead, or letting horrible things happen just for a slight competitive advantage in your electronic entertainment of choice. Gary! Don't believe us? Here are seven times when being a total bastard gave you a significant leg up on the competition. Enjoy and beware spoilers ahead for the following games. Overnight, my world has changed. The gnawing hunger inside me. Every night, it must be appeased. The thing I've become. A vampire. In Vampire with a Y, you play a character called Jonathan E. Reed, who is both a vampire and a doctor, meaning you have to balance keeping your Hippocratic Oath with keeping yourself topped up with delicious blood. Are you alright, Doctor? I... I can't see. The problem is, feeding on all those palatable platelets is the best way to get XP in Vampyr, and if you want to level up your character, you're going to have a very hard time doing so without being positive about something so negative. Blood puns, the highest form of wit. The issue is that in Vampyr, all the NPCs have detailed backstories and relationships with one another, and killing them can lock off important vendors, side quests, and certain story missions. I did not choose the thing I've become, but I can choose the lives I now take. However, all those NPCs are brimming with that good red stuff, and if you have zero scruples and just want to get as powerful as possible, there is literally nothing stopping you from draining everyone you come across, like they're an ice-cold Capri Sun on a hot day. Embrace your new nature, and once more be reborn. The more people from a district you drain, the worse the area will become, until they turn actively hostile. At this point, vampire hunters will try and chase you down, but also at this point you've got enough XP to level yourself up to where that's not going to be a problem. Plus, guess what those vampire hunters are full of? Did you guess blood? Honestly, it's like being attacked by a delicious glass of wine. In From Software's latest death extravaganza, Elden Ring, there are two ways to get better. The first is to study the game, learn enemy attack patterns and the limits of your own abilities, and then approach each encounter like a well-played game of chess. And since that's clearly not going to happen, the second way is to acquire lots and lots of runes. Runes in Elden Ring are like souls in Dark Souls, which is to say they're an in-game currency dropped by enemies when you kill them that's used to level up your abilities, giving you more health, letting you hit harder, and boosting your magical powers if that's what you're into. No judgement here. The trouble is, at the start of Elden Ring, everything you're actually capable of defeating drops a paltry number of runes that won't help much when you're trying to level up. To get the hefty stacks of runes that you need, you'll have to defeat something with an equally hefty challenge, like a Shardbearer boss or a dragon. Almost had him. Luckily for you, there is a way to get just such a quantity of runes, but only if you're willing to be a total and utter bastard to get them. Accessible from almost the very start of the game, Fort Faroth is an old castle to the east of the game's map that features one very prominent landmark, a giant grey dragon. This majestic creature is here watching over its brood of younger brown dragons and seems content to just lie here, basking in the contented glow of time spent with its family. You'd have to be a real bastard to kill it, and yet, kill it you can, and the best part is, if you go around the back and start wailing on its tail, the dragon will not react at all, perhaps assuming that it has a health bar so big that only an obscenely persistent weirdo would bother trying to kill it. This poor dragon will just lie there, not moving, while you whack away with whatever weapon you happen to have at the time, and given this giant pool of HP and your most likely pathetic damage output, you're going to be here a while. Keep it up and you'll eventually kill this noble beast, which also kills all its children at the same time, presumably dead of a broken heart, you monster.
In return though, you get 50,000 runes, which is an absolute fortune early in the game, plus a valuable dragon heart. Hope I can still spend it, even though it's broken. I'm sure this won't come back to bite me later in the game, right? From software, usually pretty good about this kind of stuff, right? Yeah, you're probably screwed. Yeah, I know. Ah! Jill. Barry, I didn't mean to get you that excited. Right. Anyway, you should read this. In the HD remake of the original Resident Evil, you play as a member of STARS, a top-tier police special weapons and tactics unit who use their elite training to immediately freeze in panic, run in circles, or wildly fire their weapons in every direction when they get attacked by four dogs. You actually get to spend very little time with any of the other STARS members during the game, except for the team medic Rebecca if you're playing as Chris, and the team's weapon specialist Barry if you're playing as Jill. Oh, I almost forgot. It's a lockpick. You'd make better use of it. Thanks. I may need it. Barry is an endearing, if odd, fellow who crops up throughout Jill's story to say weird things, offer useful items, or occasionally make the save if you've managed to do something stupid, like lock yourself in a room with a slowly descending ceiling. That was a close one. A second late, you would have fit nicely into a sandwich. As such, you'll probably find yourself warming to Barry, and even later on, when it turns out he's been working for series baddie Wesker, you'll learn that he only went along with it to protect his family, so it wasn't really his fault. Oh, don't blame Barry for everything. I hear that his better half and two lovely daughters will be in danger if he doesn't do everything I tell him to. The problem for the unscrupulous gamer is that Barry is in possession of a Colt Python 45 Magnum revolver, one of the most powerful guns in the entire game, second only to the rocket launcher. And there is a way to have it for yourself. The only catch, you have to let Barry die. Later on in the game, you and Barry come face to several faces with Lisa Trevor, a deadly and horrifying bioweapon that is keen to smash you both flat. No time to talk. Jill, hand me my gun! At this point, you've taken Barry's gun from him and he asks for it back so the two of you can fight Lisa together. Now you can either agree and give Barry his gun back. Thanks, Jill. Or say no, at which point he will get punted down a big hole to his death. I can't do that. Barry! But you got this sweet, sweet magnum in return, which, to be honest, is going to make the rest of the game a hell of a lot easier. Also, if this is canon, it means we never get the Barry Heavy Resident Evil Revelations 2, which I'm all for. Come on, keep moving. Awful. The opportunities for being evil in Sim Classic Roller Coaster Tycoon are as plentiful as the tiny oblivious idiots flocking to my theme park to have a nice day on the rides. How I hate them. Most of these opportunities for evil, though, won't make you richer or more successful in the business of running a theme park and your quest for Disney-ish immortality. Sure, you can build an excitingly deadly new steel coaster that launches your park visitors through an on-ride camera and into empty space. But then who is going to buy their souvenir photos? Their next of kin? Oh, maybe. But still, when word gets out you're designing coasters with a 100% mortality rate, that's going to hit you right in the ticket revenue. And sure, you can pick up theme park mascots like the Hand of God and drop them in the lake with the swan boats, but when they drown in front of all the guests, you're going to be less roller coaster tycoon and more roller coaster bankrupt, or possibly roller coaster person in jail for murder. What you can do, however, to indulge your urge to be a total bastard and still make bank is to construct a small inaccessible island in the centre of your park, then you add a few stalls selling food and drink, then you add a bathroom and nothing else. The lucrative business innovation comes when you set the prices on the food and drink to free, set the price for using the normally free bathroom as high as you can, and then lure the unsuspecting customers to your VIP island with its open bar and all-you-can-eat buffet. 
trapped on an island with nothing to do, their bladders getting fuller and fuller, these park guests will eventually crack and fork out to use the facilities. Oh, you think you won't pay 20 bucks to go to the bathroom, Todd P? I can wait. Todd P indeed. Soon enough, you'll have a barren waste of trash, wrecked benches and unhappy customers who can't get home. It's like Fire Festival, but it makes money. And if they get any big ideas about rising up against me, there's a daily mascot drowning to keep them in line. Too much? OK, too much. Not many would walk blindly into a crypt smelling of steel and blood, but not fear. I feel the hunger inside of you, gnawing at you. You see the dead, and your mouth grows wet. Your stomach growls. Some would argue that when you can do dragon shouts that launch enemies into the sky, you don't really need another weapon. And yet, if you want to have an easier time of it in Skyrim, you're going to need decent weapons to hit people when they get mad at you for stealing their wheels of cheese or whatever these fantasy weirdos are shouting about. You, by the order of the yard. Stop right Nothing there. Of our struggles, our suffering. Now, it is possible to do well in Skyrim using regular old swords and bows and whatnot, but if you want the really good stuff, you're gonna want to enter into a dark pact with one of the Daedric Princes. No question. There are loads of Daedric Princes in the Elder Scrolls series, each associated with a particular vice, and they all have specific quests you can do to earn one of their Daedric artifacts. Some of them are simply mischievous, like Sanguine's one where you get his staff for going on a big drunken night out. But it wasn't long before I realised you'd make a more interesting bearer of my not quite holy staff than this waste of flesh. The vast majority of Daedric Princes, however, require you to do some pretty sick stuff if you want to get your hands on these powerful items, like the quest for Daedric Prince of Domination, Molog Bao, in which you have to kill several people, one of whom you have to batter into submission first to receive a powerful mace. Mortal, I give you my mace in all its rusted spitefulness. Crush the spirit from Logroth's bones, make him bend to me. Then there's the quest to acquire the deadly Mayroon's Razor Dagger, which requires you to kill the guy who gave you the quest in the first place. In a particularly gruesome example, there's the quest for the Daedric Prince of Decay, Nimira, which requires you to lure an unsuspecting victim to a cult hideout so they can be eaten as part of a cannibalistic feast. Now we need to prepare a grand feast to welcome you to Nimira's coven. You will have the honour of bringing a fresh kill for the main course. But to be fair, you do then get the Ring of Nimira, which gives you 50 stamina and 50 health, plus health regen that lasts for five whole minutes, so it was worth the brief unpleasantness. Oh, wait, you have to eat human corpses for it to work. Oh well, in for a penny, I suppose. You cheated me! I never cheat. You can't even enjoy a simple pint anymore without falling into the service of a supernatural trickster. Or at least not if you're Geralt from The Witcher 3. Look, here he is enjoying a seemingly harmless chat with Gaunter Odim, who says he's a vagrant but later turns out to be an all-powerful entity of mischief and bargains. Two schnapsies. <laughs> It'll lift your spirits. On the one hand, this new acquaintance is useful if you, say, end up shirtless and imprisoned in the hold of a ship sailing to your execution, which Geralt does shortly after in The Witcher 3 expansion Hearts of Stone. So, do you want my help? Yes. It's a deal. On the other hand, Odim is a capricious sprite. Oh yes. And apart from burning a scar into Geralt's face as a symbol of a bargain struck, demands the Witcher help him in a mission of his own. Specifically, granting three wishes to a man called Olgierd von Everick, who previously made a deal of his own with Odim in exchange for his soul, but thought he could loophole his way out of paying the price by simply avoiding making the wishes, the sly fox. Therein lies the catch. Our pact states that before I can collect my due, I must yet fulfil three wishes for Von Everick, but I cannot fulfil them myself directly, making use instead of a... Mm, how shall I put it? A proxy. Now who's the loophole, Olgierd? No, seriously, I'm not sure. This trickster demon stuff is complicated. 
It only gets more complicated as Geralt goes about granting those wishes, especially when one of them involves getting deliberately possessed by the ghost of Olgied's dead brother so he can go and get pissed at a wedding. If I may, Shani, I'd show you how I cut a jig, nimble as a leopard. <laughs> Don't let me stop you. The fun stops abruptly, however, when all the wishes are granted and Odim shows up to collect Olgierd's mortal soul, which now legally belongs to Odim, having used Geralt to discharge his side of the contract. You forget. The pact states you can take it only once you've fulfilled three wishes and... And we stand together on the moon. Well, what do you know? What? No. Not sure it would stand up in court, but there's no time for that now. There's only time to decide if you, Geralt, are going to help Olgierd save his soul, or whether you are an utter bastard who is more interested in what a provenly evil trickster demon can do for you. Option B, please. Besides, having your soul stolen probably doesn't even hurt that much. <laughs> nope, my mistake. That looked agonizing. Anyway, rewards! Gauntero Dim's rewards for helping him on the path of bastardliness are indeed most choice. Perhaps the most appealing is the Caparison of Lament Saddle, which grants your horse a whopping plus 100 stamina and even stuns enemies who get too close. Your other options involve a filthy amount of gold and a Horn of Plenty infinite food item. From this day forward, whenever you're hungry, reach in to find something to eat. Mm, useful, sure, but we're talking about a man's soul here, for goodness sake. I think we can strike a higher price. An endless supply of vodka, or clear spirit, either will do, really. Yeah, that's more like it. You think that's a child down there? Don't be fooled. She's a little sister now. Somebody went and turned a sweet baby girl into a monster. Whatever you thought about right and wrong on the surface, well, that don't count for much down in Rapture. A great crab once sang, darling it's better, down where it's wetter, under the sea. But clearly, that crab had never seen Bioshock's Rapture because this place is a mess. Not only is it a partially flooded, totally ransacked hellhole down there, but all its inhabitants have gone way overboard with the gene splicing, leaving them as cackling monsters armed with bill hooks and firearms. As such, if you want to survive down here, you're going to need every advantage you can get. And early on, the best way of giving yourself such an advantage is by... Let me just see here. Killing children. Video game moral choices, everyone. The children in question are the Little Sisters, young girls who've been genetically altered to collect a substance called Adam from the corpses around Rapture. At several points throughout Bioshock, you will come across one of these sisters and be given the choice to either kill her, euphemistically known as Harvesting, or save her, freeing her from her programming and allowing her to return to normal. Thank you, mister. Thank you. However, harvesting a little sister provides twice as much Adam as saving one does, and Adam is the thing you need to upgrade your abilities in Bioshock. So if you want to get as strong as possible as quickly as possible, the best route for you to take is to harvest like a Nebraska corn farmer in October. <laughs> now, I'm not saying Irrational bottled the decision to make this an actual tricky moral decision with lasting consequences, but in fact, saving the Little Sisters doesn't disadvantage you much at all in the long run. Every three you save nets you a gift, plus an Adam boost, so by the end of the game you're pretty much in the same situation you'd be in if you'd been harvesting the whole time. Plus, you get the good ending in which Jack dies at peace, surrounded by all these non-harvested grown-up sisters. And since the end, what was your reward? You never said. But I think I know. A family. But if you want to get an advantage early on, harvesting is the way to go, as the Adam boosts it gives you do make the early part of the game significantly easier. And looking at yourself in the mirror, way, way harder. So those were seven ways you can succeed in video games by being a total and utter bastard. Don't do this in real life though. Be nice to people and help them 
and you will succeed and they will succeed and everyone will succeed together and it'll be nice. Uh, another way you can succeed in life is by watching one of these two videos up here. This is one from us, Outside Xbox. You can watch this down here from Outside Extra. That's a nice thing you can do f for me and the nice thing that I've done for you is make these videos apart from that one which Luke and Ellen made. So uh, watch one of those and we'll see you next time. Bye!